This is Tim Jarvis, a man famous for treacherous polar expeditions and adventures that he's always found. Tougher than I expected. Well, no shit, Tim. You walked across most of Antarctica and sailed some of the harshest seas known to humankind. It's gonna be hard. Jesus. <clears throat> but five years ago, Tim embarked on his most intense mission yet. Returning 133 acres of Flurio Coast farmland in South Australia back to its natural, original habitat. The idea with this project is bring the 54 hectares back to nature. You're not going to save the world with 133 acres, but you can show everybody what can be done with 133 acres. I think that's really the, the key message. This is the Four Tree Project. At Loiko! Tim was ever so... <coughs> <coughs> Tim was ever so gracious enough to give me a tour of this amazing South Australian property and show me how he's sprucing this place up to be a showcase to landholders, showing them how they can make a meaningful contribution to combating climate change and arresting biodiversity loss. Anything that's green is stuff that we've put in in the last five years. So we put about 20,000 trees and shrubs and grasses and ground covers. Yeah. But we're really rebuilding habitat carefully, so not just putting any old tree in. Yeah. So, and all the seed is endemic to here and stuff like that. How much did you know before you run into this project? Were you a botanist? No, no. I, look, I did a master's in environmental science many years ago and I did another one in environmental law. So I've got sort of a background. Uh, I did soil science for a period of time. So I do know the principles, but if you really ask me native plants, five years ago, my knowledge was not, not great. We grow them in here for um, for this project, but also for other landowners and other. Lo local landowners or? Is yeah, all, all through here? the Flurio. Basically anybody who wants plants which are endemic. And we do it really not because we wanted to set up a commercial nursery necessarily. We just wanted to save the world. And you know, you end up growing the plants because there are not available in sufficient numbers elsewhere. All the plants people are growing are not the rarest ones that you need for the habitat reconstruction and to save those species. This is Ranunculus papillentis, which is a very rare wetland daisy. Not quite extinct in the wild, but not far off. This one is Garnia trifida, which is another very rare wetland plant. Farmers used to drain wetlands so they can put them more more crops or cows or whatever. And so wetlands in the Fleurier and the hills really suffered. You're regenerating old farmland. What's your opinion of farmers? And I guess like wider view, like farming practice now. 50% of the habitable land on the planet is agricultural land. And 75% of that 50 is for the animals we eat. I think there's too much of it. I think there's a lot of people not doing the right thing. There are some farmers doing the right thing and there are some people I like in that kind of community, but there are there are plenty that are still not doing enough. Mm. And we need to try and change change behavior. We need it for, for, for building back more biodiversity because globally we're losing so much, so, so many of the species we share the planet with. But we also need it for climate change because carbon dioxide lasts 200 years in the atmosphere and if you want to turn around this climate juggernaut we can't just all drive electric cars and have solar on roofs. We need to be physically removing CO2 from the atmosphere and habitat is a very good way of doing that. Sustainability centre this thing. Yep. At the moment it's a, it's a shed. So the idea will be we'll put a pergola on this and capture rainwater off this building and that tank to supply the nursery. It's a building site, right? They'll be sleeping up the top there, do sort of dorm style, with uh, steps that go up to where that cupboard is and then do a right angle and go up to there. That'll be the kitchen. We'll knock some of this through Put a pergola on the outside and the idea is that this will all be uh, open plan sort of education area edu area for just you know sitting around considering life it's like chess you're just moving things around the idea is not to just strip everything out and start again but it's to reuse things so you're just moving you take it out from there you put it back somewhere else gotcha. and then we're putting some hempcrete walls in hopefully a climate positive building in other words more co2 has been sucked up into the fabric of the building than it actually takes to construct it so it's actually going to be a net carbon sink this is one of our sort of drier wetlands. It does get water in about, you know, six months of the year maybe. And then you've got the other two former stock dams, one down there and then the one at the bottom. So this has plants in it that are, that can handle complete dry and complete immersion. And the next one down is a bit wetter and the one at the bottom is plants that require constant moisture. And then you can use them for educational purposes. Yeah. And so the kids can stay there, they can go and work in the nursery and then they can see, you know, wet, wetter, wettest.
So that's the solar shed, that was pre-existing. It's all off-grid here. There's no, no running water, there's no sewer, there's no electricity, it's all off-grid. So this is the main rainwater storage for this seed orchard. So we've got 480,000 litres of storage here and, and we're just gearing up for the next planting season. So that means you've got to reclaim every single one of these tree guards and stakes and make sure you've got enough for what you're planning for this year, which is 6,000. And each one of those bundles is only 50, so you need 120 bundles. There's about uh, 20 bundles there, so we've got a long way to go. All I see is the ongoing ongoing jobs at the moment, but uh, that's okay. So I'm just looking at the weeds in here, so I better not look too closely, because I can see <laughs> there's work to be done. But What's the timeline? Well, we've been here five. There's never a done we're done, we're finished, but five The point years. at which nature will start taking over, I'd say it's probably five years off, where nature starts to crowd out the weeds, produce seed, drop it on the ground, and you end up with the offspring of the trees that you put in a few years ago. That's gonna start happening, I reckon, five years. And look, it is very uplifting, really. When, you, when you're in amongst all the bad news in the world, it's, uh, it's good to come here and go, well, look, this isn't gonna happen on my watch. At least I'm doing my bit. Quite a large operation, just for one, yeah, for one man. It's a big, it's a big operation. Why do you think I look like this? <laughs> so look, it's a lot of work. There are good volunteers. We've got a, a team of people who work here. With, they're about a two FTE, I suppose, between three or four people. Look, I've done expeditions for many years and the only way you can get through them is to really sort of, um, you know, you've got a big plan, you put in place what you think it's gonna take to achieve that plan. But once you're in it, don't look at the big picture, just look at the small steps, celebrate the successes and just chip away, you know, just don't worry about things you can't control and just, just focus on the um, immediate stuff. I remember in this whole valley, apart from these bigger trees, just had nothing in it. And now, put all this stuff. What does a utopia look like for you? I mean, the magic number is 30%. Ocean and land that we need to return to nature. That's the, that's the number everyone's kind of agreed on internationally. Whether that 30% is going to be a bunch of kind of national parks uh, with everything else outside those national parks, business as usual. If we're trying to get to 30% of ocean protected and 30% of land returned to nature, you might have 20 to 25% within kind of national parks and, and then, or protected reserves, but then the, the other, you know, five to 10% will be made up of farmers doing things a bit differently on land and cities greener than they are currently uh, to reduce things like the urban heat island effect of with climate change, cities becoming hotter and things like that. So I think we'll see change practices across the board with some set aside areas of, of, of pristine nature in, in, in reserves and marine sanctuaries and national parks and things like that. Advice for people that aren't traversing Antarctica to fund these amazing projects, what we're doing here at Fork Tree. Sort of their day to day, how can they change a few little bits to help your mission became a, become a little bit easier so you're not so focused on education. You can roll in, people are rolling in and say, oh, I already do this at home. Yeah. Um, what sort of, I don't know, three tips? Well, look, I think look, if it's climate change is an issue you're dealing with, I mean, 40% of Australia's carbon footprint comes from the energy required to heat, light and cool buildings. So everyone can have influence over what their energy plan looks like or what sort of lighting they've got. And if money allows maybe putting a solar array on their roof, think about, you know, cycling to work, all, all the stuff you've heard about, eat less meat. Uh, don't just replace every meal you would have had meat with, with seafood, because that also has a big a big carbon footprint. If you have a, a garden, plant out your yard with, with native plants that, that, that encourage native insects and native birds. And, you know, go and have a look at a map of what your street looked like before it was your street, oh, yeah. you know, and, and, and think about putting back some of the vegetation that was there before Adelaide was Adelaide or Sydney was Sydney and just see, see if we can't rebuild some of that habitat one backyard at a time. I think that's really exciting. No one should feel that their contribution can't make a difference. It certainly makes you psychologically feel a lot better if you do something. And Anita Roddick, who founded the, uh, the environmental retail of the body shop, she said, if you think being small can't make a difference, try going to bed with a mosquito in the room. And I, and I thought, <laughs> you know, we've all got the opportunity to do something. That could very well be my favorite quote of the Act Local series. If you know another local legend doing cool shit to protect the natural world, comment their name down below and we'll link up with them. Peace.